We are looking today at what has been called the Great Commission. This is, in a sense, Jesus' last will and testament for his disciples. This is, this is what he wants from them. But I'm going to tie together Jesus' great commission and the greatest commandment. Those two together, the great commission and the greatest commandment. So we're going to head in that direction today. The great commission. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. In our Christian tradition, we believe that Jesus died on the cross. He paid for our sins. All of us who believe in him, who rely not on ourselves, but on Jesus, Jesus has paid for all of our sins on the cross. And to prove that the cross was acceptable and Jesus' payment before God was accepted, he rose from the dead. And then afterward, he ascended into heaven. And between his rising from the dead and going up into heaven, he spent some time with the disciples. And during that time is when Jesus gave this commandment or this commission to them. And what is a commission, everybody? You sell 10 bucks worth of chocolate and you get a dollar, right? That's a type of commission. But the word is in there, which is what it means, right? Mission. The mission that Jesus entrusts to the disciples is this commission that Jesus has given to them. So we're going to take a look at that first and then see how it relates to what we have traditionally called the greatest commandment. And we're going to take a look at that in just a minute. So let's take a look, first of all, at Jesus' commission to his disciples. If you were, you know, my wife has often said, make sure you say some good things before you die. And I'm dying, right? Make sure you, you don't, I'm, 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 I, I'm dying. And I, uh, I need to go to the bathroom and... Uh, that's it. Don't do that, okay? Say something profound that we can remember, all right, and, uh, and uh, before you die, okay? Now, Jesus had already died. He was going off into heaven, and this is, these, in a sense, are, are the last words he entrusts with the disciples. So we should really pay attention and focus in on what Jesus says, all right? So these are the words that Jesus gives to them, the Great Commission, He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right. So from this, we're going to take a look at three things. First, let's take a look at the message or the mission that Jesus sets the disciples on. This is what they are to live for. This is what they are to accomplish. This is what they are to lay down their lives for. Okay? This is what Jesus is committing to them. What is, what is it that Jesus is committing to the disciples? To make disciples. To make disciples. Make more disciples. Make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them. Teaching them to observe everything. What is a disciple, everyone? A disciple is a person who follows the teacher. And the Bible says it is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher. That's your goal, to become like the one you follow. In Jesus' case, to be like Jesus is what discipleship is all about. How does that happen? Through baptism and through teaching. Baptism and teaching. Let me address those really quickly. Next week, we're going to have baptisms. We praise God for you, Elizabeth, and we praise God for you, Joshua Kai. What is a baptism? It's really good for us to know what a baptism is. There are different ways of baptizing people. There is dunking, there is sprinkling, there is padding, there is pouring, all kinds of different ways to baptize people. And they all, if you put it together in one meaning, and at this church we recognize the legitimacy of all of those baptisms, right? We had a good discussion the other day with one of you, right? We recognize the legitimacy of all of those baptisms done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are baptized, and one word that really encapsulizes what baptism means is identity. Say that word, 
identity. It means you are identified with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are sprinkled with his presence. You are washed clean by Jesus' blood. You are identified with Christ. His righteousness has become yours. His family has become yours. His body is where you belong. And when you proclaim that in front of a watching body of witnesses through this process of baptism, whether you are dunked or whether you are, you know, there's there's an advantage and disadvantage to all of these methods. One of the most dramatic ones is where you go all the way under the water. And there are positives and negatives to that. Positive is that it is a beautiful picture of going under the, 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 into the ground with Jesus and rising again with him. And, uh, but there are also drawbacks, depending on how you have the, um, the baptismal. In one particular case, they had a baptismal behind the, the pulpit, above the choir, right? Above the choir. And they had the baptismal in the back there where they dunk people. And on this particular, in this particular situ- incident, the lady that was getting, par- getting baptized was particularly large, and the, and the pastor who was baptizing was particularly strong. And he said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As soon as she went in, the water just poured over the baptismal and baptized the whole choir. Okay? So there are drawbacks uh, to those kinds of situations as well. Sprinkling is good. Sprinkling also pictures, you know, the, the, the Bible ta- says, says that I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water and you will be clean. Uh, and it's also a picture of the, of the Holy Spirit and his anointing over us. So it highlights different aspects of this one truth of identity with Jesus Christ. So Elizabeth next week and Joshua, Kai, and Joshua, what in the world are you doing getting baptized? <laughs> you know, he's, he's one of our Sunday school teachers, Lord's Day school teachers. It is because we thought, we thought including Joshua, that he was, had been baptized a long time ago, and there was some miscommunication between he and his parents, and it turns out he never really was. And so we get to baptize him here, and it's exciting, and I'm really grateful for that. So, yeah, Elizabeth and Joshua, when you get baptized, you're saying, I am identified with Jesus, and I'm saying no to every other ultimate allegiance and saying yes to Jesus. And when they, when they do that, we as a congregation also take responsibility to care for them, to guard them, and to guide them to grow into Jesus' likeness as a community, as a family. So basically, that covers the basic, basic meaning of what baptism is. It's a very, very, very significant, significant thing that we get to do together, that we get to celebrate with you. So baptism. Now, baptism pictures the gospel, You don't have to be at a certain stage in your Christian faith in order to be baptized. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if Jesus is your God, you should be baptized. That's the gospel, right? All you are saying is that you belong to Jesus. Pastor Paul, I really haven't quit smoking. Okay, well, quit. (laughs) Eventually quit. If that's something that you want to lay before God, go ahead and do that. But what I'm asking you is, do you belong to God? Fundamentally, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Fundamentally, is he everything to you? And when he is everything to you, the other things will eventually fall into line, and you need to be baptized. It just means that you're you're a disciple, not a mature disciple, certainly not a perfect one that nobody could be baptized, right? But just that you belong to Jesus, But then that's where the teaching comes in, where you train and you teach for a person to become more and more like Jesus. So go and make disciples. I always differentiate between churchians and Christians. Churchians are churchgoers. Christians are disciples. Notice the way I say that? Paul, you got to learn to speak English. That's not the way you say Christian. What is that? I'm doing it on purpose, okay? Christ in. That you belong to Christ. That Christ is your identity. Like when you say um, Korean, American, you are, so you're saying your identity. 
When you say Filipino, right, the, the Philippines first part comes into the first part even though you change the spelling and everything and confuse everyone, all right? <laughs> even though that is the case, still it belongs in there and forms your identity. When you say that you are a Christian, you are saying that forms your identity more than anything else. Uh, more than a, uh, before I'm a teacher, before I'm a mother, before I'm a husband or a wife, I am a Christian. All right, so... Teaching them to become more and more like Christ, to, li- to living that out. That's the message. Not to make churchgoers, but to make Christ lovers. Okay. Hey, does my wife and I look alike? Do my wife, my wife and I look alike? Some of you nod, some of you yes. Say, some of you say no? Okay. Well, a lot of people you know, have said that we look alike. Kind of sucks to be her, right? <laughs> kind of unfortunate. But it is said that when people love for a long time, they begin to look like one another. They pick up each other's mannerisms and even expressions and things like that, like it or not. So find somebody who's good looking, all right? So no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Plus and minus right there. But anyway, okay, don't do that calculation. Just never mind, okay. Not going there, but um, to become like Christ. Discipleship. Second, let's talk about the scope for a second. What is the scope that Jesus gives to them? He says, go into all the, what, everybody? World. Go to the ends of the earth. Go to the whole world and make disciples by the power that I have given to you, by the authority that I give to you. Go and make disciples of all the world. What is our goal as a church to make, in making disciples? Is it to fill this room? Is that our goal? Is it to fill a certain number, like posted on the wall, 2,000 by 2020? Is that is, 2,020 by 2,020, is that, is that a good catchy phrase that we should go for? Filling this room, too small. 2,020 by 2,020, too small. What should be our vision for making disciples? It should be global glory. Global glory. Whether we are directly a part of it or not, our sight should always be on the vast expansion of God's kingdom to the ends of the earth because Jesus' glory is worth it. Can I get an amen? Uh, Let me tell you something. Loving people as wonderful as that is, and I'm going to... I'm going to just press, that, press into that with you today. But as wonderful as that is, that is not enough for worldwide missions. Why? Because especially here in America and in the San Fernando Valley, the world comes to us. What is enough for going to the world is to see that God deserves praise from all the nations. And for that purpose, to lay down our lives... That's what makes life really worthwhile, to live for the global glory of God. God deserves glory from every tongue, tribe, and nation. God's global glory is our goal. Can I get an amen? And when we do that, filling this room and all these other things, they eventually take care of themselves, right? Yeah, it would be wonderful for me to preach, for me personally, to preach to a packed group, to have multiple purposes and stuff multiple services and stuff, but that's not our goal. That's not our goal. And ultimately, if we, just with this group right now, impacts the community, impact the community and the world for the glory of God's name, I am more than satisfied with that. And I praise God for you, and I do, even now. Within that acceptance, within that grace, let's strive for the global glory that God deserves. That is our goal. And nothing less than that. That's the scope. What is the key? Because global glory, that's huge. Right? We all want to live for something bigger than ourselves. And the global glory of God is something for which we can lay down our lives. It is something that we could sink our teeth into. We men especially are so ambitious. And I want to tell you today, filling a room is not going to fill your ambition. All right? Having a good job, having, having a nice house, having 2.5 kids, 
no matter what the 0.5 might look like, okay, that is not going to fully satisfy you because your ambition, you are created for a higher ambition. And that higher ambition can be nothing less than the glory of God. Whether you are succeeding in your school, succeeding in your work, succeeding in anything, if that is not geared towards someone eternal or the one eternal, then it will end in disappointment. And I would spare you the pain that right now you would gear all your study, all your effort for the global glory of the one you love. And here is the key. How are you going to do this? Pastor Paul, I'm too young to do this. Pastor Paul, I'm too old to do this. Pastor Paul, I'm too untalented to do this. Pastor Paul, I can't sing in order to do this. Pastor Paul, I don't have this, I don't have that. But you have Jesus, right? And that's what Jesus bases everything on. I love how this commission is given. The book of Matthew starts with God with us. What is another name for Jesus? Do you know? Emmanuel, okay? Which means God with us. Notice that the book of of Matthew begins with Emmanuel, that's Jesus, God with us, and closes with Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. Because Jesus says, I am with you till the end of the age. I am with you. Till everything is done and beyond, I am with you. And the commission itself starts and ends with God's presence. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and see I am with you. See, Jesus' authoritative presence, it starts there and closes with his loving, authoritative, permanent presence. So it's all about the presence of Jesus. And when you have Jesus, loved ones, young people, students, let me talk to you, right? When it comes to impacting your friends and impacting your school and whatever God will put you to, there's nothing that God cannot do. And it is true when old Southern preachers, Southern Baptist preachers used to say that you and God make a majority. (laughs) I love that. You and God make a majority. (laughs) It's true. It's true. You and the Lord make a majority. Be brave. Be strong. Step out in faith because it's worthwhile because Jesus goes with you. His authority is the authority with which you you go out. His power, his loving presence is what you are banking on as you do this. Not your own power. You have no authority of your own. Pastor Paul, where do you get that authority to huff and puff like that every week yelling at me like that? Right here, from the presence of God, I have no authority of my own. Many of you have much more life experience and much more education than I do. I, have, I derive no authority from those sources. My only authority, ultimate authority, is the presence of Jesus, his authoritative presence. And this is what he means. He doesn't say, all authority has been given to me in order to say that this, he got something that he didn't have before. Or, or something strange has happened here. What he is saying is, because this is his authority as the creator, it is his authority by birthright. But what he is saying is, through the cross and resurrection, the doors of the gospel have now been flung open. We are not limited to where we can go with God's presence and God's authority. We are authorized to give the invitation to all the people of all the world, to the Taiwanese, to the Filipinos, to the Africans, to the Caucasians, to the Koreans, to everyone, to all ages, to the youngest, to the oldest. We are now authorized to men and to women, to everybody. The doors have been opened. The authority has been granted. Where it was going to the Jews first, it was limited somewhat to them. Now it's open to everyone. And now, since I have this authority, I give you, Donna, this authority to take it to your husband and to your children and to all your friends. I give this this authority, Daniel, to you to take it to everyone that you see in Magic Mountain as well as in your schools, everywhere. You have this authority. You have his presence. It has been granted. It will not be revoked. Okay? This is the key. Jesus' authoritative, loving, living presence is the key to accomplishing the commission. 
Jesus gives, equips you for everything for which he sends you. Jesus equips you for everything for which he sends you. Where will you fulfill this great commission? All of a sudden, this is just off the cuff right now. Some of you are afraid of your future, what your future holds. Maybe you're going through some financial difficulties or relationship difficulties. Some of you, young, you are planning a life ahead with somebody else, and you're afraid what that holds. But I want to tell you today, as a child of God, you have every reason to hope that you can live out the great commission in your marriage. You can have a marriage that sings the praises of God. You can have children that sing the praises of God. And when you fail and when you falter and when you fall, and you will, in the process of that, you will still have the presence and the acceptance of the loving, living Savior, his authoritative presence to shape you, to mold you, to make you more and more like Jesus. Can I get an amen? So be bold, be strong, take risks. Take risks. Don't be like this person that, I, that I've heard of who divorced his wife because he was afraid of bringing children into this world. No, take risks. If, this, if you're convinced by the scriptures that this is the path you should go to live out the commission in this area of your life, take that risk. Risk is right. It is worthwhile in Jesus. You've prayed through it. You've got the confidence that you need. Do it. Attempt it. What if I fail, Pastor Paul? What if she says no to my date proposal? There is authority <laughs> and there is power to overcome that too. I remember a, a pastor, I've mentioned this to you before. He said, you know, you guys, you guys got to need to grow a backbone. You see someone with whom you can carry out the commission and have a loving relationship that glorifies God. Go to that person, pray about it, and go to that person and say something like this. Here's my job. Here's my Bible. Are you interested? <laughs> She says, no, move on, okay? <laughs> I wouldn't put it that harshly. Pray a little bit harder. Be a little bit more tender. But at the same time, I would encourage that kind of boldness, that kind of risk. Rejection hurts, I know. But once you have this kind of authoritative acceptance in your life, risk is right, risk is worthwhile, and it's worth it. So I want to encourage you with that. How do you carry out the Great Commission? There are many ways you can carry out the Great Commission. I mean, like all of you have received, most of you, I think at least one little kind of flyer that invites people to church. It says, come to church or come out to church. It's right, right in your face. We're not hiding anything. We're not presenting a concert and pretending that it's just a concert and then sneaking the gospel behind the door. No, we're saying come to church, right? I don't mind those kind of backhanded ways of doing it too. I mean, whatever. So I'm, not, I'm not above that. But I think it's fine to just say, come to church. It's church. You know, come on out. I think people would, uh, non-believers would be very uh, appreciative of that kind of honesty and that kind of straightforwardness. And if the Lord is knocking on that person's heart, drawing them, they'll come. They'll come. So you can just pass out flyers, Right? <laughs> One statistic says that if you pass out 30,000 flyers, 300 people will come. 30,000. All right, let's go, let's go print them out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, those kind of, we're not relying on those kinds of methods, but yeah, sure. That kind of research could be useful, could be helpful. What others? Okay. Uh, pray with your wife. Pray with your husband. Read the Bible together. Meet up with somebody in the church. Read a chapter of the Bible once a week and talk about it. Pray over each other. Very simple, right? What if I misinterpret the Bible? What if my partner says something really, really funky? Come talk to me, okay? <laughs> and we'll get that straightened out. We'll get it worked out. But the Bible is clear enough. You'll get more than you lose. You'll gain much more than you lose out on. Right? Those are some good methods, very simple, and you can think of a lot of other things. But I show you a better way. I show you a better way of carrying out the Great Commission. And it's the Great Commandment. It's the greatest commandment. 
It's like, you know, all of these other methods, all of these other methods are, I was going to bring a bunch of candies, right, and tie them on strings and tie them to this ring, right? And let's say you want to organize all the candies, you want to put them together, but the strings get in the way and all of that. What you really need is just this ring because everything is tied to this ring. If you pick up the ring, the candies organize themselves, right? If you focus on the candies, you're never going to get them organized, but if you just pick up the ring, they organize themselves. Does that make sense? Okay. This is a wedding ring. This represents love. What is the greatest commandment in the Bible? It's the commandment of love. Pastor Paul, you're going to have to prove that, okay? Let me give it a shot. God is love. Jesus is the greatest expression of God's love. And to be like Jesus is what it means to follow his commandments and to become a disciple. Therefore, the greatest commandment is love. Good logic? (laughs) Booyah. (laughs) Boom. (laughs) Okay, but let's go a little bit further. Let's go a little bit bit further. The Apostle Paul himself, he says this, if anybody keeps the commandment of love, he has kept the whole law. It is the fulfillment of the law. It's the fulfillment of the whole Bible because love is what motivates all of the commandments of the scriptures. Love does no harm to to a neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the Bible. I love that. Let's go a little bit closer to Jesus. Somebody came up and asked Jesus how it is to receive eternal life, how they can, re- a lawyer asked him that. And Jesus talked to the lawyer and said, asked the lawyer, what is your summary of the law? He says, to love God with everything and to love my neighbor. And Jesus said, you're right. That's it. That's it. Jesus, on another occasion, he said it himself. Somebody asked him, what is the greatest commandment? He says, to love God with one's all and to love our neighbor Everything is summarized in this. There's no greater commandment than this. It's the one commandment, the greatest commandment. All right? Now, how does this connect? The greatest commandment, how does that connect to the great commission? Jesus said this as he washed the disciples' feet. He says, if you have love for one another, the world will know that you are my disciples. And our theme verse for this ministry, John chapter 17, verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be one in us, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. How is the world going to know that you are Christ's disciples through the love that you have for one another? Love is the greatest tool for evangelism, greatest tool for, commi- for the fill- fulfilling the Great Commission, greatest tool for church growth that God has given to us. And if you minus the commandment of love, I don't care if you have a wonderful program. I don't care if we fill this room ten times over. If you don't have love, if we are not a ministry that is characterized by love, then you got nothing. You got nothing. You got empty. You got an empty shell. Right? I want us to be known for standing on the word, standing on the truth, but not at the expense of love. The truth should fuel love. The truth should be inviting as well as at the same time cutting away everything that doesn't fit into the holiness of God. That spiritual surgery is a loving surgery. And the Lord will do that for us, and he will not compromise love. The Bible tells us, you know, some of you say, but i got to tell the truth. I know I know one pastor who was confronted with being unloving about the truth, and he says, even a knife knife is stuck in my neck, i got to still tell the truth. But the Bible says, speak the truth in love. If you cannot speak the truth in love, then you are disqualified to speak the truth. If you can't talk about hell with tears, then you are disqualified to talk about hell at all. Here's what I mean. And let me go now into the method, because it's clear that this is the method that Jesus used, the tool that Jesus has given to us, I'm going to get back to the other thing that I just mentioned just a second. 
So the first thing that you need in order to evangelize this way, what you need to do is to behold the beauty of the love of Jesus. How are you going to display what you don't behold? How are you going to share what you don't got? So first and foremost, you must be the recipient. You must receive the love of Jesus. You must see how he has loved you. You must see how beautiful he is. How beautiful he is as the creator of the universe. As you look around and you can look around at the, at the sky like God came down and painted it just for you. When you see that, that is the beauty of a God who is so loving. That's King Jesus painting the sky on your behalf. When you walk around and look at nature that proclaims the beauty and the consistency of God, you see the sun rising and setting. That displays the faithfulness of God. Did you know that the sun rising and setting is based on God's consistency? It is meant to proclaim his faithfulness to you. And Jesus is the summary of that faithfulness. In faithfulness, God sent his son. In faithfulness, Jesus came. In faithfulness, he gave his life for you. And for me, see that beauty, see his faithfulness, see his love in his patience with you, where you have sinned again and again and again. You have dis disappointed everybody else, including yourself. And when you are ready to give up on yourself, God will not let you go. Do you see the beauty of that love? When my wife will forsake me, when my husband will not forgive me, the Lord will stand by me. He will not let me go. Do you see that, the beauty of that love? That loving acceptance where, where, where God in Jesus engulfs you into his family of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he will never let you leave. There's so much freedom, so much joy, so much goodness, so much purpose, so much meaning in that. And when you find yourself there, then you are equipped to go ahead and share that. Before we get to the sharing, however, let me get to the second part. Once you receive that kind of grace, once you receive that kind of love, you start seeing your wife, seeing your husband, seeing your friends, and seeing your enemies even differently. The second step is this. We need to share that love with one another. We must be loving toward each other. When I see Selena sitting right there, I can't just think of her as Pastor Manny's niece and Sister Lorena's daughter. I can't just see her that way. I've got to see her as a sister in Jesus Christ with whom I will spend all of eternity. And that's a good thing. <laughs> Look at the person sitting next to you right now. Look at the person who is sitting next to you, all right? Be good to that person. Be good to that person. It is for your own good that you love that person. You know why? Because you're stuck forever. And not just any kind of stuckness, but a stuckness that is oneness. Because you are engulfed in the oneness of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, it, for me, some people say, Pastor Paul, I, I notice a certain love about you. It just kind of shows up on your expression, on your face, and I know not all of you see that. Some of you, you think that I'm kind of harsh, and you're, you're right, I have that, that side of me too. You know, I'm often told, you got to say things a little bit more softly or smoothly. I, I got that, and that's kind of the forceful, kind of like, I, I like to think that's the manly side of me, but I don't know, whatever, okay? <laughs> I have to temper that, but in as much as you see the love of God in me, I want to tell you, that didn't happen until I think I've been a Christian for a, very, for a long time. I think over 30 years now already. Woo! But that didn't really happen to me until about 10 years ago when I started to think about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so in love that they are one. And that being included into that oneness is what the gospel is all about. That the goal is all about, of sharing that oneness and that love with my brothers and sisters. That's the goal of salvation. That is heaven itself. And when I realized that, I started to see people differently. Sometimes, you know, I take some of you out, and, and, and we start to talk. And, I, and genuinely, the struggles that you, you endure, it breaks my heart. 
And, you know, sometimes you know, in, the, in the middle of the conversation, without just it's even tears, that wouldn't have happened 10, 10 years ago. It wouldn't have. But it's real now. Because the Lord has caused me and caused, is causing us to understand and know a little bit more of what it means to be bound together in the unity of the Trinity and the family of God. And when you do that, then you are equipped to use love as Jesus used it. To love the world as Jesus loved it. Jesus, the, the scene that I see is Jesus looks at Jerusalem. He knows that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. He knows that the people there are going to perish in the fullest sense. And he cries. He weeps. Right? Look, Jesus knows that these people are going to be condemned and he weeps. We don't know that the people we love are going to be condemned. Why are we not weeping? Because we have an opportunity to weep on their behalf in hope, not despair. Because we don't know if ultimately that person is going to be included in the oneness that you and I get to share. Has that oneness been good? Then you're going to want to share it. Have you had a good cake? You're going to want to share that. You're going to, you're going to want to tell, no, you don't. <laughs> you're, going to to, you're going to keep it to yourself. I, 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 I don't know. But if it doesn't cost you anything, or you just want to tell them, you know, that place has really good cake, right? Share the news. You're going to want to share that. You're going to want to share it. So when you love Jesus like that, when you love one another like that, that love cannot help but overflow and reach out to people who have not tasted it and have not known it, who have not literally tasted life itself. You're going to want to do that. And I would encourage you to do that. The early church was compelling because it was loving. The early church was compelling because it loved God more than life that they were happy to lay down their lives for King Jesus. They had to stop people from volunteering to be martyred for God. That's how much they valued King Jesus and how sure they were of him. But further on out, you know what the Romans were saying? These Christians are weird because we discard our children. They have letters of a husband who is on a trip writing a letter to his wife. It says to the wife, sorry ladies, but if, the, if your child is a, is a girl, throw it out. If it's a boy, keep it. That's it. And they had every right to throw out the children. And the children would be thrown out on the streets and the children would die there. And the Christians would go by and pick up these children, dead or dying. And if they are dead, they would give them funerals. And the Romans are looking at that. They're saying, they bury our dead. And they were shocked with that. And that kind of love flipped the Roman world upside down. In church history or just, just, uh, just uh, you know, human history, the church has had this kind of witness where there was a plague in the city. Everybody was busily running out of the city. But the Christians, what they would do would take the gospel and all the resources they had and they would go into the city. Everybody was fighting to get out. They were fighting to get in to love on the people that were there. They're counted even a privilege to die along with the people who had come to Christ through their witness. Wasn't that good? I pray that the Christian church would continue that wonderful, wonderful tradition. I am not a traditionalist, if you know me. I don't do tradition just for tradition's sake, but there are some traditions worth keeping, and this is one. To have that kind of a radical, self-sacrificing love that the world has to stand and take notice. I want more and more to be instances like this where an atheist, and there's a, there was a, there's an atheist club, and they came up with, this, with an official statement, official letter that says, you know what, it's so strange to me, it's so strange to us, but we got to admit, Christians are more generous than us, <laughs> and we should be ashamed. That's good. That's the way it should be. Christians should not be known for being stingy. Christians should be known for being sacrificially generous and sacrificially joyful and full of life 
And I pray that the house will be a house of that kind of love, that kind of life, because this is the tool of evangelism that God has granted to us. When we come together and worship like this, and we love on one another with people who are not like us, what are we trying to do? We're trying to live this principle of love out, right? Notice that this is all worship, oneness, witness, right? Beholding the beauty and the love of God, worship, loving one another, oneness, and that bleeding out into witness as we love sacrificially for all the world to see as an open invitation to the family. That's the way it should be. Can I get an amen? I close with this, just this one story. And I do tell it and retell it because it is so, it hits the, the, it hits the, the issue on the head, the nail on the head. A while ago in my old ministry, uh, in my old ministry, there was, you know, I served a bunch of guys that, you know, who have like gang experiences. This one dude, he took off his shirt, and I saw this word Korean pasted right across his chest, right, tattooed right across his chest. Like, I'm not arguing with you. <laughs> You're Korean, okay, that's fine, you know. And so these guys were coming and coming to the church, and, and it was a wonderful opportunity to, and sometimes, and not often, but some of them would come drunk and things like this, and some guys would come, and they would, you know, they would just not get along. And this one particular instance this guy, he got in a fight in the parking lot with another guy who both had gang backgrounds, taking off their shirt. Why do you always take off your shirt to fight? I don't get that. You know, don't you need a little padding if you're going to tumble, right? But they're all talking about your shirt, and they're about fighting and stuff like that. And he's throwing F-bombs. He's throwing F-bombs. His girlfriend is throwing F-bombs. His girlfriend is throwing F-bombs all over the place. And the pastor walked up to me. He said, your guys are in the parking lot throwing F-bombs. I'm looking at him going, and I didn't say this out loud, and that would have been me, but is, really, is that really all you care about? Really? Is that all you care about? And one of those guys, he was saying, you know, he was so flabbergasted that he got into this. He said, he, he, was, he, he said this as he left. I come here to change. I come here to change. And may our church be a place where people come to change. People see the compelling love of God and become transformed more and more into Jesus' likeness. Will you be committed to this? To fulfill the great commission by obeying the greatest commandment.